All Things Alice. This podcast will explore the cultural phenomenon of Alice in Wonderland as artistic landmark and global symbol of inspiration and imagination. I'm your host, Frank Bedore, the author of the Looking Glass Wars trilogy. Let's explore what is it about Alice? Welcome to the show, everybody. I am delighted to introduce one of my favorite people to play golf with, or better yet, as a dinner guest. We met years and years ago in Malibu on the golf course, and I liked this guy right away. Only later did I find out that he had won an Academy Award just a few weeks earlier for writing one of my favorite movies of the year, Dead Poets Society. I'm thrilled to have my good friend Tom Schulman on the show today. He's written across so many genres of movies and had a string of hits with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, What About Bob, Medicine Man, Indecent Proposal, just to name a few. So let's drop down the rabbit hole of Hollywood. And as the Cheshire Cat likes to say, we're all mad here. Welcome to the show, friend. Hey, Tom. Let's talk about the writer's strike and the... Work you did on the committee, would you say is the committee uh, of uh, negotiation or is it the board or how do you? Uh, We call it the negotiating committee. Okay, so my understanding, uh, my friend Ed Dector, as you know, your friend as well, told me that you got a standing ovation for the work that you guys did and the concessions that that you got from the uh, the producer. So how do you think that's going to translate now moving forward? Uh, I believe you guys ratified it yesterday, right? Yeah, 99% to one. Who was the one percent? Well, not one person. Ninety-nine. It was like nine thousand yeses and ninety nos. Yeah, I wonder why. Then what? What do you think the nos were about? I, I don't know. Either they thought the deal wasn't good enough, or they just protesting the entire process. I, hard to know. <laughs> <laughs> they they did not identify themselves. When they put it so. <laughs> we don't know. Well, they definitely, you definitely, um, you know, it seems universal that you guys came out really uh, on top with almost all of the um, items that you were looking for. So would you say that's right? I, I would say, yeah. I mean, obviously, you never get everything you want, but yeah. I, I would say we got the vast majority. Certainly got something in every area we, we were asking for, which is unusual. There was nothing we put on the table that we didn't make gains with. So that's that was that was important. And, and uh, so essentially, we didn't leave any of the writers behind, as often happens with these negotiations where the companies figure out, well, the uh, comedy variety writers are, are a very small minority of the guild. So the guild would never hold out just for the comedy variety writers. So they tend to not give them anything. And the people who are making the deal, the negotiators for the guild, essentially have to to you know leave them behind. That didn't happen this time. Oh, terrific. Yeah. So what I've been hearing, though, is there may be some contraction that p- the producers are going to be looking for smaller budgets, all yeah. of which makes some sense um, because they were running rampant with their productions and the cost. But uh, yeah. how do you yeah. think that's going to affect... Um, you know, the writers and the deal that they have moving forward. Do you think? I mean, they'll blame it on us. Of course, they'll blame it on the strike. They'll blame it on the SAG strike. But, you know, as you say, this was happening anyway. So I I don't really think it's strike related. If anything, the strike was an opportunity for the companies to to, uh, all contract at the same time, which is hard for any one company to do when your competitors may or may not contract, it's tough for you to do it. In this way, it made it easier for them to all say, well, you know, Netflix has to contract. We all have to do it. So right. beyond that, I think that this was something that was coming. And as someone said, you know, we reached what they would call peak TV at four, 599 in discrete series, you know, so. And it's not just, it's not just in our industry because labor is, is rising up all around the country with the UPS and the auto workers and, you know, unions are really showing their, their strength and um, trying to help the, you know, the working class. So. Yeah. Yeah. I I like to think the Writers Guild, you know, sparked the so-called Arab Spring of labor in America, (laughs) but that's not really true. It's obviously 
you know, been coming for a while. And you, you've been seeing little rumblings of of labor organizers at, at Amazon and, yeah. and Starbucks, et cetera, over the last couple of years. And, you know, this is the first time that many labor unions have finally gotten to flex a muscle. And it's long, long overdue, you know. Yeah, it, it, that's what it feels like. It uh, feels like it was all bubbling and it was just a matter of time. So, yeah. But anyway, welcome to All Things Alice, um, where we uh, we talk about Alice in Wonderland, but mostly we talk about Alice as a muse for creativity um, in terms of imagination and curiosity and the creative process. So I'm going to ask you about um, your latest film, Double Down South, which is a high stakes gambling movie about Kino. Um, but what I'm curious about, you know, I've- Kino pool, Kino pool Kino. Not, that, not that bingo light game they play. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Kino, Kino pool gambling, good right, point. But, so, um, yeah. but uh, you know, I've, I've known you for a very long time and you've written some amazing movies, but can you just describe when you're writing a, a of script that you know you're going to direct. What is is the is the framework a little bit different because you know the scenes in your mind that do you write less description? Do you write exactly the camera? You know, you can do different things when you're directing it. And I'm curious right. if you do in fact do that. No. Mm -mm. No? I, I write everything as if I were directing it, as if I were making the movie on the page, you know, so I, and to the extent that I feel like I need to describe things, you know, if it were just, if it were a script just for me, maybe I'd leave those things off, but it's going to go out to, you know, artists and, you know, crew and actors and so forth. So it needs to read exactly the way a regular script would read. So this story is really about an outsider breaking in, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, what do you think? I mean, that seems like a a, a, a trope that's very popular, especially if you do it well. What do you mm. think it is that resonates with, I mean, is the underdog is what resonates with, uh, with viewers? I think so. I think it's the, you know, we, we are all in that situation at some point in our lives, at least most of us. So I think people can relate to those feelings of being, you know, on the outside looking in, of having to struggle to find your way in a in a world that you is not as familiar as as it hopefully will be at some point. So I think it's the underdog too, you know, that sense that everybody knows everything about this except you, hmm. and then, so you've got to somehow get your get your way get through all that. Well, d describe for the listeners the movie, because uh, I don't know how many people, I didn't know anything about Kino Pool until mm -hmm. I came to your, uh, till the screening. Yeah. So uh, what was the inspiration and describe for us, you know, describe the movie a little bit. Yeah, I think, I mean, the inspiration was that I used to play that game back in my youth, you know, when I would visit pool halls. It's a, an unusual game. It's a, they put a very thin board on the top quarter of the table, and the board has holes drilled in it for every ball in the pool rack, and, and also a double hole in the middle, and there's a little ramp up off the, the felt of the table onto the 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 Kino board and the board is very very smooth. The holes are are drilled to very precisely. So it's unless you hit the hole exactly, the ball will loop out, perhaps go in another hole, more likely just drift back down the board and off off onto the table again. And what's diabolical about the game is this double hole. If mm. you uh, make a double on the break the bet doubles and you get paid double and you get to break again. And if it doubles, it do the bet doubles again and so forth. Oh. So uh, a novice like I was the first time I played it <laughs> uh, can, can get in some real trouble because uh, the first time I played it, you know, I, I was very young. So a dollar meant a lot. And, you know, when you're in a pool hall and you put your dollar up on the, on the table and you wait your turn, dollars your placeholder and when i uh when it was finally my turn to play the guy who had won before it was he got to, to break so he made a double on the break and i got ready to give him my dollar and he said no you don't understand you owe me two dollars it's double so i gave him another dollar and then he said uh and i got ready to shoot he said no 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 i keep shooting until i miss okay so he <laughs> breaks again and he makes another double and he said that'll be four dollars 
And I'm like, oh my God. So I gave him four dollars and I said, you know, uh, if you break again and win again, do I owe you eight dollars? And he said, You're a smart kid. And I said, I said, Well, I don't have eight dollars. He said, Well, you got that watch you're wearing. So I went, Oh my God. So I, you know, fortunately he broke and he missed. And I got ready to shoot. And somebody said, you know, if you shoot and miss, it's his turn again. And then it starts all over. <laughs> oh, boy. So the first time I played, I didn't even get to shoot. I walked away. <laughs> so you really didn't play. You were just the no, sucker. <laughs> no. So, you know, there was this the very attractive woman who came into the pool hall every so often and played Kino down there with all those guys. And us young kids, you know, guys would stand down there and watch her. She was really attractive. We hope maybe she'd glance over at us and never. Never, never did. <laughs> and uh, so I was fascinated by her. And, you know, I made some notes very early in my career about her and then just forgot about it. And right when COVID hit, I was thinking about what what to do. I remembered her. And then I started thinking thinking about, you know, when to, when to play. When, first of all, is, is Kino still around? And it's not. It, it lasted about 100 years from like the early 20th century to the end of the 20th century. It was banned in 17 states because it was such an intense gambling game. Uh, it's by far the hardest shot in pool. There's nothing even approaches how difficult it is to make even a, getting a regular ball in its hole, much less a double. But um so I just uh, sort of one day started making notes and then the, the story that is the movie came to me about this this woman, this, you know, who's trying to make it in that man's world of Kino, you know, which in this case is played at a plantation house or an, a falling apart plantation house way out in the sticks in Georgia, where, you know, the best come to play Kino Pool. Well, what was terrific about it was the blending of suspense and drama and some comedy. So mm -hmm. when you're writing, you know, obviously in film, tone is so important. What were you, you know, striving for in terms of that combination um, for this for this film? Right. I, you know, I, I work from story first. Mm -hmm. You know, story will give you those elements if it's if it's that kind of story, you know, but I think there's always humor in 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 any story because the interactions between people are going to create that. But uh, and so I just, you know, those things are sort of, sort of give themselves to you as you write, you know, but but just staying on story, figuring out the di dynamics between the characters and so forth as the story evolves you know, to get to the ending is the, is the, the, is, is really all I do. And the humor just hopefully comes in the middle of that process. And how was uh, getting back uh, in the director's chair after uh, many, many years? Yeah, it was scary. I mean, years ago when I made eight heads in a duffel bag, which I know bazillions of people haven't seen, um, <laughs> it, it, uh, it, it, things like lack of sleep, you know, just essentially feeling like you're playing chess with the universe every day because the elements change. You've got an outdoor shot and suddenly it rains and you can never go back to that location. So what do you do? And, you know, you're constantly rewriting for that sort of thing. So that that really worried me that and, and lack of sleep in that on that movie was just a killer. I was getting three or four hours a night and getting pretty frazzled. So I was worried about that. And, you know, um, some of the difficulties making that movie just made me really afraid to do it again. But but uh, this time we had a great crew, great cast. And, you know, I still only got four hours sleep, but I was never tired. But this was an independent film. So it was a little bit yes. it was a little bit smaller than Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag, which was a studio right. movie. Yeah. So yeah. you probably had more freedom, but then you have all these budgetary restrictions which yeah. is what I confronted with Wicked, which w it was really fun to be making the movie and making the moves wherever you needed to make them. But yeah. it was mistake after mistake and they compounded each other. On the studio movie, you know, you had all these resources and you had longer days and more more uh, staff and crew. Mm -hmm. So right. um, uh, how, did that, how did that play out in terms of the budget and the amount of days and how you could make your days? Yeah, it was really scary. We had no overtime, no nothing in the budget for overtime. What? None. 
it was, you know, you're, you're shooting a day and when that day's over, you're, you're out for the day. And if you can't get this done in 22 days without overtime, then start figuring out what you can jettison. What so, happened on locations where you had to move and you were trying to get shots? Did you ever have to reduce the amount of coverage or did you like get really creative in that day? So here's talk to the DP. What can we do? Yes. Yes. I mean, we, we, when we, we were really only in three locations, the interior of the plantation house was one location. The exterior was, was, you know, several hundred miles away in South Carolina and we shot it in Georgia. And then the third was pretty close to that, that house in, in South Carolina. So, um, when we moved to South Carolina for the last four days of the shoot, pouring down rain, turned, I mean, which the DP said to me, wow, great, you know, which is great <laughs> for atmosphere, but hellish when you're trying to shoot, you know, and we had shots with moving cameras on cars and, you know, the lens just gets soaked. And so, but fortunately, you know, I had a cinematographer who has to be one of the fastest in the business. Oh. He was amazing. So, you know, he would even say to me, cause we'd stand there talking about whether I'd gotten all the coverage I need on one side of the room inside. And he would say, I'd pause for a second thinking about it. He goes, don't even think about it. Just let's, let's flip. If you need something else, I can, I can turn it back around in about four minutes. So it was just like, okay. He says, it's going to take you longer to figure out whether we need to turn around. <laughs> so, so, um, so that was a huge help. I mean, Alan, Alan Cardillo was just astonishing in that way. And I think he got a great look at the same time. So um it, it, uh, but you know, it was very nervous making it just every day, you know, but I had a, 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 a whole assistant direction of a department that were just, they were, they said, unless, unless we bother you, you're doing fine. So there was, the, took a lot of pressure off. Oh, I mean, that's not, terrific. To not have people, you know, hitting their watches and going, we're in trouble more, you know, twice the whole the whole film. And so. you also had a good friend in Kim Coates as I the did. star, yeah. uh, wow. a, a friend of ours who we've golfed with uh, for many, many years. I'm I'm assuming based on what you just said, your schedule, you guys didn't go out and play any rounds of golf during the shooting no. of this. <laughs> no, <we didn't. laughs> so but my yeah. point my question is, I guess my point is is that Kim, as a good friend, I'm sure was a great collaborator where you didn't have the same situation, eight heads in a duffel bag, and you had an right. actor that was kind of confrontational and slowed things down, So, it, yeah. which made that movie difficult, as I remember you telling That's me. That's right. That's right. Uh, Kim was was a prince, you know, and, and we we had five days or four days of rehearsals, which you sort of have to have in a movie like that. I can, if we had had to spend time when we got to the set each morning, figuring out the scene, rehearsing it, you know, that sort of thing, we would have never made it on those, that schedule. So a week of rehearsals essentially was a week, you know, you still have to pay the actors and so forth, but that that allowed us to, to, to make the movie in, in the way we did. And Kim was just, you know, 100% there the whole time. The actors all stayed in the same uh, Victorian bed and breakfast house, and you know bonded and they that, that helped create the the sort of you know dysfunctional family that the movie is but a family a sense of that couldn't have done it without kim and, and you that. discovered uh the lead the the girl lily simmons right yes and well i wouldn't you know i think she had already been discovered to a certain extent she had a big part on a series called banshee but uh which was not as you know successful i don't think as it should have been it's a really terrific series um, so, uh, and she's been working since I think she was 18 or 19 years old, done a lot of great stuff. So, uh, but not a big name at, at that point. So, well, and also in a lead role in a movie, she just, yeah. uh, she, she really, you know, she really did an amazing job and captured the essence of that outsider and that character. And she was, you know, she was great yeah. as, uh, she really pulled off the pool playing. Yes. Yes. Well, our, our friend Matt Craven, who's an actor and <laughs> yes. also a phenomenal pool player, uh, met with me and her one day uh, about two weeks before we went on location and just to see her pool skills. And she said, oh, yeah, I've played a lot of pool. Well, no, did not look <laughs> like she had played pool. So Matt volunteered to spend as much time as necessary to teach her how to play pool. So they played every day for a couple of weeks. And 
you know, she got pretty good. She got certainly good enough to look like she was great, but she, you know, she, she made a couple of double, you know, they, they didn't get a chance to practice Kino. The boards were not ready. So they just, she just learned how to play pool, but, but she was good. Sounds like you you uh, you reached out to all of your golfing your golfing family. Uh, I, I did <laughs> for help wherever you could get it with their various skills. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, they, we certainly don't I have. Spared, I spared you, but yeah. yes. <laughs> well, we certainly don't have the skills in golf, so let's, we, don't, we no. have to look <laughs> elsewhere. Um, yeah. Well, and also congrats because you went on a film festival tour. And as I remember reading somewhere, you won uh, a couple of audience awards. Uh, yeah. What was that yeah. like? It's very, it's so exciting. You know, I mean, it, in this day and age, it's not typical to even get to see your movie with an audience at all. And, you know, so in this case, I've seen it with, you know, at five or six festivals. And it's it's just really fun to, you know, to see a crowd react to the movie. Were the reactions from city to city or state to state um, pretty similar? Or did yeah, you find yeah. somewhere? Or, and also, I have a question about the time of day that the, that the screenings were. Because on Wicked, when we had early screenings, it didn't do so well. But if we had a midnight wow. screening and everybody was a little bit tipsy from dinner, we did great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. No, we, we most of our screenings have been at seven o'clock at night. But at one of our the festivals, we had one that at night, and then the next day there was one at like two o'clock in the afternoon, and that was the the two o'clock in the afternoon was the best one. It was in a regular theater, not not the a theater that was part of the arts center for that festival, and you know it was just the crowd. I mean, it was the best crowd yet. They were just they got every joke, every line, every every nuance, which was fun. So years ago, when I read the script for Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag, uh, made me laugh out loud. I knew you were directing it. I thought it was going to be, you know, really successful. And then you had a really difficult experience. And I often hear directors or friends, I've had a few friends who've had their first movie. And if it doesn't go well, you you are in what people call director's jail. What happened on that movie in terms of, you know, the little thousand cuts that took away from the 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 vision that the the script, uh, you know, which you had originally created, which felt so funny and vibrant and and connected yeah. to the movie that it, you know, was it a casting thing? Um, because I know you had difficulties with some of the cast, but also the lead guy, the kid, um, that was a difficult role. Anyway, why don't you tell us? Well, we, we cast a, a part, not the lead kid first, we, um, over my objections and um, way early. And, you know, it, to make a cast work, you're always making sure the chemistry is right and so forth. And Andy Como, who played the lead, might have cast him anyway, but we ended up casting opposite this other character so that ultimately that was driving all the decisions about not only the casting, but the writing that had to change to go around it. It was infuriating and quite obvious to me that you, you cast your lead first. That's just what you do. And then everybody else you know, is in orbit around the lead. And so um, I would say that was the biggest mistake. And that so was the, and that was required to get the financing. Is that why? It was not. But but one of the producers, for, unfortunately, was doing a favor for his agent by casting this person. Oh, no. Yeah. And um, first of all, you know, it, producers having agents, I don't really understand because, you know, you've got to be able to sort of play the field if you're going to produce and take you know, be able to cast from all the agencies, not not favor one. But that was the case. And and so, you know, it was really irritating. When it first happened, I thought, well, it was just, this is just kind of talk. But then as it got closer to production, I realized that person was being foisted on me. And it was, you know, I went into the producer's office and said, I, you know, a year from now, whatever, when we sit down and watch this movie, we're going to regret this because I'm now having to change everything in ways that are not good for the movie mm. to make this work. So artistically, that was the big, that was a big mistake. And then, 
you know, it, it, we were under budgeted and just racing around, you know, there was a time when the, even though it was a studio movie, it had a bond company and the bond company came to me about seven or eight days into the shoot and said, you know, da, 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 you're way behind so forth. And I said, not only am I behind, but we're going to get even more behind two weeks from now when we get to this airport. And they go, you can't be saying that. You can't say that. I said, I'm saying it. And they mm. said, don't tell us that. We don't need to. <laughs> I said, if you're going to fire me, fire me now, because I'm telling you, we can't do that sequence in, in a day and a half. It's a three day sequence period. And that, you know, they walked out furious, called the producers. Producer said, that's not the way you talk to the bond company. I'm like, so they, you're a terrorist. They started telling me <laughs> so it was just, it was, it was really, I remember we shot a lot of sequences in the, in the, near the Mojave desert. And in the morning I would get up and drive out there and every morning as if to torture me, there were these vans full of people going on vacation up to Northern <laughs> California. And I just thought, why can't I be in one of those? Vans? Why do I have to be here doing this? It was, I had just like a prisoner in a cell. I had a calendar next to my, uh, in the bathroom and every morning I just X out another day and, uh, you know, will this ever, ever end? I mean, I think people are interested in why movies, you know, turn out so bad sometimes. They go, why, why is it? And that's the, that's the point is, uh, is that you make these early choices and you can't catch up. And in, 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 in casting, I mean, I think it was uh, Hitchcock there said 90% of what he does a successful movie is casting. And so, you know, you yeah. were, you had 10% chance and, um, and that's, yeah. that's really unfortunate. And then, and I guess because you're a first time director, people feel like they have more leverage and power over you. So then there's a power structure. And then you're the one who's in director's jail as if you made all these creative mistakes and Absolutely. you don't get to direct a movie for 10 years. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I, the night after the movie premiered and the studio pretty much dumped it because this uh, Orion Pictures, which made the movie, s sold itself to MGM the weekend, bef two weekends before we opened, although they didn't announce it until the week we opened. So on Monday before the the movie opened, I got a call from the head of marketing at Orion who said, I just want to say, I'm sorry. And I said, sorry for what? He said, I, I can't tell you right now, but you'll know at the end of the week. And I said, what does that mean? Are, are you dumping the, he said, dumping would be, you'd only wish we were dumping the movie. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, you know, so all this work and you know, uh... it, was, uh, it was really painful. And then of course, the morning after it opened, it was like 4.30 in the morning, my phone rang and it was my ex-agent who says to me, Shulman, five years. And I said, what? What do you mean? I said, what happened? Bad numbers? He goes, five years minimum. I said, <laughs> what does that mean? He goes, director's jail, five years. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Oh my God! Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. terrible. Well, let's go way back then. Let's go back yeah. before you know, before there was TikTok and uh, and cell phones when you first came into the business, because you had a really crazy successful run in the late '80s and early '90s. Is it true that your first movie, uh, Dead Poet Society, that was the first produced movie, or no? No, I, I I had written two movies that got that I sold as spec scripts for features that that ended up being made at ABC for as movies of the week, and you know bear for very little resemblance to what I wrote. But uh, so I kind of don't count those. I you know okay. I watched ten minutes of each and just had to turn them off. It's like oh my god, this is. Uh, and then I sold a script called Second, Love at Second Sight, about a psychic detective agency solving crimes that haven't been committed yet. Um, but that got eviscerated too. And that came out and just plummeted into the, into the ocean um, maybe six months before Dead Poets came out. You know, I remember oh, my dad came uh, out here, my parents came out here and we went to a screening of that movie at Warner Brothers. That's where I met the director at the screening. And, uh, 
my dad at the end came just leaned over to me and said, you, be, you better find something else to do with your life. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, well, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm curious. Cause I don't, I don't, I mean, I know your dad uh, was a doctor, but uh, yeah. what, w- w- tell me about mom and dad and your writing uh, and their, your aspirations versus theirs. Uh, how did, what did that look like at the dinner table? Uh, my parents were great about that, you know, and uh, end of my freshman year in college, my dad was a doctor and I, I was really, I had gone in as pre-med and I was doing well, but I said to dad, I think I'm I'm going to go ahead and commit and, and go to medical school, you know, try to go to medical school. And he said, you know, you grew up with me as a doctor. Do you really want to do that? Have you, did you pay close attention to what my life was like <laughs> in the early days? How little I saw of you and, you know, and I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I enjoyed going on house calls with you and stuff like that. And he said, I, I think you should just think about it. It's one thing to, you know, it's an, uh, he said, I, I've loved part of it, but I haven't loved it all. And uh, you should think of it. And I thought to myself, maybe I don't really want to do this. And I said, well, what will, uh, what will I, he said, you'll find something else to do. So I think two, three years later, when I started getting interested in making movies, they were like, writer, director, writer, you know, you never been a particularly good good writer you know you, you make b's on your essays and so <laughs> forth and i said yeah this is different and they said well you know if that's what you want to do give it a shot so you know i got into to usc film school and came out here and you know was kind of too too cool for school and quit and they were like what, what's going on and what's happening with you out there and of course they're friends over the years i was i'd grown up in nashville and now i'm out here in l.a started asking what's what's going on with Tommy is he is he ever we're going to ever see anything that you know and that was you know uh, a dozen years of you know essentially you know being in the in the wilderness yeah. waiting for something to happen and you know my parents were always yeah but are are you sure and you know you getting getting up in age and what <laughs> what's going to happen <laughs> so they were just worried you know supportive and and worried at the same time well, let's talk about those dozen years and where story where story comes from and ideas. You mentioned at the top of the show that you had written some notes and they were put in, a, I guess, in a in a you know notebook somewhere. So, what were what was coming to you uh, in terms of things that you thought would make good movies? Were was it genre related? Related? You said story is what drives you first and foremost. Yeah. Where did that stuff come from? Was it a curiosity I, of life? I, Imag- I imaginative. Started writing horror films. You know, I the, I had gotten it very lucky that after I quit USC, I was out, I had gone in to see if they would give me my money back because I quit in the middle of the second semester. And of course they wouldn't. And I was sitting on a wall, you know, trying to figure out what to do. Um, and the this guy walked up to me and kind of stared and he said, little Tommy Shulman. And I said, what? He goes, I was a teacher at your high school in, in the junior high when you were in high school. And, and I heard you were out here and now I, I, you're him. Right. I said, yeah. And he goes, you look look miserable. And I told him why <laughs> I, said, I know exactly the place for you to go. So he sent me to a place called the Actors and Directors Lab that was run by Jack Garfine, who had been a theater director and a film director, brilliant teacher. And I enrolled in that workshop the next day. And the first class I was at, I was sitting in the back, just essentially, you know, trying to figure out what the hell was going on there. And one guy walked in and said, I just got a, a, a contract to make uh, 75 educational films over the next three years. And I need a crew. Anybody in here done that? And I had worked making commercials in Nashville. So I raised my hand and he said, well, come see me. And I did. And he hired me. So I had a job for the next five years, really, where we were making educational uh, three weeks. We'd make the film two weeks. We'd take off, do it again. So I had two weeks between every in every cycle to to write. And about Two years into it, he got a. Uh, uh, his wife was a potter. She met some people who wanted to make a, a, a movie, finance a low budget movie, and he came in one morning and said, "I need a script by Friday with Monday. Can anybody write a script by Friday? I'll pay you five thousand dollars if you can." <laughs> so I raised my hand. And they said, so what do you want to do? And I said, "Well, if we're going to make a low budget movie, let's make a horror film. And how about a mummy movie?" 
I was always fascinated. He said, okay. So I wrote a script called Sarcophagus about this mummy that is brought to a university, you know, atrium and so forth. It was pretty scary and he liked it and he showed it to the backers and they said, you know, we're Mormons and we can't back a horror film. So, <laughs> he, so Bill, my boss came in the next Monday and said, can anybody write a family movie by Friday? And I said, I- I'm too burned out. And a guy who was working for him named Desmond Nakano who ended up writing a movie called Boulevard Nights and another one, I can't remember where Harry Belafonte and John Travolta play black and white where blacks are the dominant group. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, think, I can't remember that. Anyway, Desmond said, I can do it. So he wrote the script and three weeks later we were making a, we were preparing a, a set up in Saugus and, and building a ranch and so forth. And maybe two months later we started making the kid from not so big and the, the, um, uh, extras on the movie were the Mormons who were backing it. They were all in Western. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they came up to me and they said, you know, we liked your horror film. We just couldn't do it. Can we pay you to write another movie to do something after this? We'd like a comedy. And I said, sure. So, you know, what do you want to do? And I came back and said, how about a sort of Kentucky fried movie or everything you want to know about sex, but in the world of sports? So uh, they said, OK, so I called it Mondo Jocko. I got a friend, my friend Hall Davidson, and we wrote it together and uh, the Mormons loved it. But the lead Mormon and they let me shoot it. They said, we know you want to direct. So they let me shoot a day of it. And um, uh, the night after they screened it, the lead guy died of a heart attack, lead Mormon producer. So <laughs> so it now fell to his wife. She had Oh, notes. my God. Long story short, it never got made. But now I had this little horror film, Sarcophagus and Mondo Jocko, as sort of sample scripts. And I sent them out and ended up getting an agent, Betty McCart, who it turned out was one of the sort of uh, important people behind the scenes in the making of The Godfather. She was Al Ruddy's assistant. Oh, wow. And she knew the ropes at the studio. He didn't. So she was, uh, but she never told me that. I didn't know anything about her history. Anyway, she became my first agent. And then, you know, it was writing spec scripts and mostly thrillers, horror films, stuff like that. Um, because you've had you've had a number of comedies with What About Bob and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. But then you had this, you know, major drama, a Dead yeah. Poet Society that you won an Academy Award for. Um, after that, did they want did folks in town want you to write other dramas or were you writing no. specs or how did that all work? They wanted comedies. You know, the, the summer, the summer that dead poets came out, I think two weeks before that honey came out. So honey made more money and honey was more reproducible. I mean, they, they considered movies like dead poets society, a kind of one-off. Mm. So they don't know how to, I mean, if you have another idea or something that, that, that sparks them or, or, you know, really hits them in the gut, they'll do it, but they're not asking for that. They want, they want more comedies, more mass market, obviously mass market comedy. When, when you were writing um, dead poet society, uh, were you writing with an actor in mind or a person you or it was just the story as you said earlier that's yeah i mean i that story started working its way into my brain in the late 70s early 80s i had a girlfriend and we we'd go out for sushi many nights a week and i would start telling her about that story and she kept saying keep working on that i love that teacher blah 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 and um you know it did i kind of i wrote a draft in maybe 1983 and it was all the teacher Students I paid no attention to. I read it. It doesn't work. I put it in a drawer. And two years later, I I, uh, woke up and went, oh, it's about the students. It's about its effect on the students. And then that that started to really then it started to really put itself together. But it was not easy to get made. As I remember you telling me a story that it was on the desk of your agent who was not doing anything with it when is this right a producer picked it up and started reading it and asked about it and then he said yeah yeah. uh yeah i think i think no i think the the my agent sent it to stephen haft in the early going stephen had had a, a movie made with um robert that all robert altman had directed so stephen you know was was trying to get stuff made he read it and liked it and then nothing happened. He just did. He, you know, I don't think he had the wherewithal to get it made or whatever. 
what what happened was a director named Jeff Canoe was uh, looking for, he had a deal at Disney to make a, a musical. And uh, so he was looking for somebody to write a, an ensemble movie. And my agent sent him this, sent him Dead Poets Society. And he called back and said, I don't want to make this musical anymore. I want to direct that. So he went to the studio and they read the script and they bought it for him. And then came the chore, the problem of casting it. His ideas for casting and theirs were different. They were the same, but he couldn't get get Robin Williams at the time to say yes. He, Robin wouldn't say no, but he wouldn't say yes. He supposedly had some misgivings about the director, which turned out to not be true. But anyway, it didn't work. So the, Disney eventually gave him the chance to set it up somewhere else with other actors who were not well known. He couldn't get that done, and then it reverted back to the studio, and they got eventually got Peter Weir to do it. Wow, how lucky all of these little steps along the way to to get to uh, the final product that won the Academy Award for you. I think Jeff would have done a great job. You know, we shot one day, we had the sets built and everything, and then when Robin didn't show up for the first day of shooting, they canceled the project. What? You know? What? He was cast in it and he didn't show up? As I said, he would he didn't say yes, but he wouldn't say no. So Jeff Katzenberg at the time, I think, was gambling on the fact that oh, Robin would wow. not let this go. He, they they knew he loved it, so they were thinking he wouldn't let it go away. So they just kept pressuring him by saying, you know, this is the start date, blah, blah, blah. We have, you know, they acted in, in, as if he were going to be there, but he didn't show. So that was it. They, they, they uh, burned the sets and uh, everybody was off the movie. Well, and you so. got a but you got a great director in Peter Weir. Um yes. were you on the set rewriting or because you know uh Robin Williams is so known for improvising and coming up with things and being, you know, kind of, you know, off script. So how yeah. was how yeah. was all that managed? Uh the the bizarre thing was that the first day Robin was 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 so on script that it was almost wooden. He had he remember he knew it word for word and it just was filled it just didn't have any life to it and I was panicking and saying oh my god and we only had Robin for one day and then he was going off to do something else for two weeks I think he was in a play in New York and then we would get him back so you know I was standing by the director's side after each take going oh my god and so he goes I know I know just be quiet we'll fix it. and nothing <laughs> happened so. Robin left and I said to Peter, what are we going to do? He goes, we got two weeks to figure it out. So when Robin showed back up on the set, Peter had him do an improvisation. We were in the classroom then. And improv was, you know, if you wanted to teach these kids something, what would you teach them? Robin's like, oh, maybe a little Shakespeare, maybe I'll read to them. So they got him a book and he came in and did that improvisation that's in the movie where he's John Wayne doing Macbeth. <laughs> and, uh, and he had a book that he was reading to the kids. And as soon as Robin was improvising, he understood what he was not doing with the script, which is that it's a dialogue. It's just like stand up. You're you're looking at the kids. You're looking to see if they get getting what you want. You're teasing them. You're cajoling them, doing all that stuff. And that which is what the, the the character was doing. So he just got it immediately after that, and it was you know full of life and and problem solved. So when you were talking with your girlfriend and you were working on the character and the original script, how much of your self, um, because it's a movie that's about nonconformity, uh, your father actually pushed you away from <laughs> following the path of conform conforming to what right. he did. Um, it seems like those two came together to at least thematically really tell a story that was personal. Yes. I mean, I, you, you know, I think you don't really, somebody said, I think, you know, I write to, to, to understand what I think. And I think that's what happened here. You know, you just start writing this teacher and pretty soon you'd figure out what, what he's about, you know, and then, you know, I always knew he would be in this sort of, you know, uh, uh, tightly wound institution. So the, the rebellion against that sort of came naturally, I think. And the casting of the, uh, of the students was really, 
magnificent. Um, you know, to be able to cast something uh, with all these, I'm, I'm assuming they were all unknown at the time, correct? Yeah. And, yeah. and then have them gel. And here's my question. They all felt so lived in. Mm-hmm. Often your characters feel lived in. Mm-hmm. What, how do you, how do you get to that point? How, what are you thinking and trying to create to, that has that feeling? Because they were probably some of the most lived in teen characters that I've ever seen on, in, I mean, in cinema. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were fantastic. Well, it's partly the writing and partly the direction and the casting. And, but, but from the writing standpoint, once I understand the function of a character in a story, then I sort of cast around in my mind and who do I know from my life? And could have been somebody in kindergarten, could be somebody in college or after college. But who do I know that would fit that role, who would who is like that enough that I can put them, their face, their their person in that character and and then I'm writing as if I'm them? You know, so that's, you know, every character is cast out of my life that way. And so, you know, they're behaving the way I think they would behave. And maybe that gives it more, more life than if it were just some, you know, not just. If it so you, it were just yeah, way. yeah. So yeah. you have a picture of somebody or you have an experience yeah. with somebody that you're pulling, matching that up or using imaginative and creative um, ideas, but, um, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I also, it's a little bit of, I mean, I can remember one time driving up to one of our golf tournaments in, uh, north of Santa Barbara and it was, I don't know, 90 degrees out. And I was driving up alone, you know, getting ready to do some, and, and I somehow started improvising this white sharecropper <laughs> in the South from about 1920. <laughs> and, it's like, and I just started talking as if this guy were sitting on the porch. And then I realized this is going nowhere. I don't know why I'm enjoying doing this, but I realized that's kind of what writing is. You know, you just put yourself in that person and you just start yakking, you know, and you, you, you know, the, and you may be making up the circumstances of their life as you go along, or maybe you think about it beforehand or a little bit of both, you know, but that's, that's sort of what I think I do when I get in these characters, you know, so it's a bit of insanity really, but uh, kind of guided insanity. <laughs> <laughs> Madness put to work. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you did take acting classes for a while, right? I'm yeah, assuming yeah. you were taking acting classes not as much to become a great thespian as for yeah. your writing or directing, how to work with actors. So um, w- I understood the mechanism. I certainly did not have the courage or the free sense of freedom to be able to just let go in front of even the small audiences we had. But, you know, the I, I mean, when I started the Actors and Directors Lab, I I, had, I told you know, I want to direct. He said, well, then you're going to have to act. And it was like, no, no, anything. <laughs> but that. <laughs> you know? but, uh, but that was forced on you. And probably for, you know, for good reason, because the process of acting and the process of writing and direct, they're all high, very, you've acted, yeah. really connected. So, you know. It's, so what what monologue or scene did you have to do that was memorable or, or not? Uh, the first exercises they gave you were really hard because you're essentially sitting in a room, your own, you know, you imagine yourself in your own room and, if you, if someone is going to be coming over to talk to you about something, something you make up. You don't tell the people in the audience any of the circumstances that you're just told this is what you're doing. Pick a circumstance and and prepare for them to come over, you know. So it's, oh, my God, you just it's like what? <laughs> and so you, what you start to realize is that the more more you fill it with compelling circumstances, the more you can forget about the your fact that you're on stage in front of these people and start to actually try to work out what you might do and do what you might do if that person were coming over. So if they're just coming over, you know, and you have nothing like they're just coming to have a beer, you're just you're on stage. I, I'm just on stage sweating with self-consciousness, you know, <laughs> but if I, but if it's, you know, my girlfriend coming over and it's the first time we might have sex. Okay. That's a different <laughs> then Now I'm up and around and I'm doing, you know, I'm getting ready. So that's, so, you know, and uh, so I, you learn to, to fill, you know, what you're doing with the, speci- the specificity of each. An intention. Each you have the intention yeah. and you can have the business. 
To change gears for a second, I'm really curious, you know, I, I think a lot about when I watch sports and folks are on a run, whether it's in baseball and, you know, they've gone a couple of years and they, they, they have a really high batting average. And in the beginning of this, I talked about the early, uh, late 80s and through the 90s, you were on a run where you had What About Bob and you had Dead Poet Society and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and Indecent Proposal. And I remember you sold Medicine Man for a lot of money back when Spec Scripts could buy you a house. Um, yeah. What, what was that? What was happening creatively? And then what was in your mind about how this is going or this could all go sideways or I could keep what, how, how are you, how are you dealing with, with, with that um, uh, success? It was hard because, you know, if it's like once you've had success like that, then, you know, the world is just, they're throwing things at you, you know, and it's very hard because you could spend all your time just reading scripts, you know, that people are want you to rewrite or rewrite and direct or whatever. And so it's it's very busy. I, I don't think I paid for a meal for three or four <laughs> years. <laughs> and uh, but um, and then there's this sense of pressure, you know, because whether you like it or not, people are saying things to you when you write something like I would never give an Oscar winner notes or, you know, the, the sense of honesty and the things you want from people starts to go away. And then, you you know, that you, it's very difficult to survive that, you know, so. Uh, and then, you know, you start making a lot of money and, and, and then your lifestyle ch changes to, you know, spend that money. Yeah. <laughs> and so you have a house and the family now, you know, things are, and so the obligation to keep that going is, is intense too. So it's, it's, uh, I wish I had it to do over, but you know, you, you just do the best you can at the time. And you had a great run and, yeah. um, and I'm also, you know, curious because you said you had all these, there's a lot of rewriting. And when you rewrite other people's scripts, you can make a lot, especially back then, you could make a lot of money per week. Yeah. Uh, but you chose, at least in Medicine Man, to write a spec script, which sold for, I don't know, like $4 million or something. And um, so... Is that what the discipline was? Let me do something that I believe in, that I understand, and I'll put my attention there and better myself versus let me try and clean up somebody else's scripts and make my payday and 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 see what, what goes on, what happens with those movies. Yeah, I don't think I was thinking commercially so much with that. I mean, it seemed like it was not a commercial idea to, you know, a guy in the rainforest, but, uh, and, you know, discovering and losing a cure for cancer. But but, um, you know, and that was just and that idea had been in my head, you know, to do for a couple of years. So once, you know, sort of Oscar season was over and so forth, that's like I rewrites were coming to me. But I just thought, no, I really want to do this. And my agents all said, sure, just go do it. So um, uh, and, you know, rewrites are a particular kind of hell, I find, because they don't really want your full you know, faculties engaged in it. I mean, usually it's particularly the ones where they pay the most, which are production rewrites, you know, they're very close to production and it scares them to think that you're going to come in and make a lot of changes. They can't even, they're too locked into too many locations and mm. actors and so forth. So you come in and you read a script and you think it needs, you know, A to Z and they go, no, we just want A and B. And, uh, and, you know, and, and they're going to pay you a fortune to do that. And you get to the point where, you know, I'm, I'm pr I got to be pretty fast. So I would do A and B in a couple of hours. And then I would literally spend the rest of the week just figuring out how much money I was making. <laughs> it was it was a horrible feeling, really. So after a few of those, I just thought, I, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this. So, I, I would like to live with that horrible feeling for a couple, I know, of, but couple of years. I remember reading about high class <laughs> prostitutes who would, you know, felt so bad about the money that they would go out and spend it immediately and just buy things that they didn't need, fill their apartments with, you know, lamps and furniture and stuff. Just it's like guilt money. I don't know. <laughs> but I felt the same way. It was something just I know it sounds silly and everybody would be thrilled to make that kind of money. But it just it just felt. Well, bad. I mean, you're not that good looking. You're not good know, to, to make that kind of money. But <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> So, um, well, and you know, I got an, I, I had enough, I, I, I offered enough good things 
things that, you know, to rewrite and direct, or in most cases, I would pitch originals and people would, would buy them. So, you know, why not? That was, that was the, the way and, I went. And the, um, the indecent proposal was a unusual development in terms of okay. you didn't write it, but you optioned the book when you lived on my street many, many That's years ago. That's right. I live right next door to where you live now <laughs> yeah. and across the street from where yeah. you live now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, same time. And uh, my next door neighbor was Alex Gartner, who you know well. Who I'm working Alex with. Was, uh, the, right? uh, Alex was reading the book and he was working for a company. They were actually making an early version of A Hand, Handmaid's Tale. Oh, wow. And, really? Yeah. Yeah. They made it. And um but Alex was reading Indecent Proposal and he would come over every morning at like seven in the morning and we'd play ping pong for an hour before he went off to work. And we were talking about the book and and the book, you know, the, the basic premise of the book of billionaire playing or, or in that case, a multimillionaire uh, giving a, a woman a night, you know, paying her a million dollars for a night uh, of sex seemed like a really uh, interesting idea. But the way it was worked out of the book, not so much. So uh, I took it. To, I had I was working at Paramount at the time, and I took it to Teddy Z, who was a junior executive there, and pitched him the basic idea. And uh, Alex and I had optioned the book for next to nothing, and Teddy loved it, and he bought it. And we hired. I we both thought Alex and I both thought we need a woman writer for this. It should be told from the woman's point of view. So we hired Amy Holden Jones, and by the time we turned in the script, Teddy was gone. She he had moved to Sony. The the regime that had bought it were gone, and but they, you know, the new new guys bought it and made or owned it and made the movie right away. So. But something happened with that I, because you were producing it, and you ended up executing executive producing it, and it was Sherry yeah. La Sherry Lansing wanted yes. to produce it, and right. you said no, and she said. I'm going to pay you a bunch of money for you to step right. back. So tell me about that. Well, Sherry, you know, and I guess she read it and um, I don't know why. I guess she had made Fatal Attraction with Adrian Lyne. Okay. And Adrian was sent the script to Indecent Proposal. And from Sherry's telling, she spent several hours on the phone convincing Adrian that, that it, this should be his next movie. And for that, she wanted to be the producer of the film. So, or a producer of the film. So Alex and I talked about it and we decided, no. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, at that point, you know, the they, my, my lawyer said, well, they're gonna just fire you and pay you off. And then he said, I don't know how this happened, but I'm looking at your contract, you can't be fired. <laughs> So he said, Did, I, I, wait, wait, I wait, 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 wait. Did you know that when you did not know that, oh, okay. but, but he found that out. He said, let's get the contract out. He said, undoubtedly, this is your first producing thing. I'm sure I don't have that in your contract. And then he said, oh, my God, I got you that. <laughs> he forgot. <laughs> so, uh, so at that point, you know, we decided Sherry really wanted to do it. The studio started and she started, you know, they said, well, we'll pay you more if if you share. So that became a kind of indecent proposal situation of, on our own. And, you know, eventually. And then once we agreed, then it came back that Sherry did not share producing credit. She, she would not. So it's like, so, so you guys are going to have to become executive producers. So, OK, more money. And then are and you then kidding we, me? It really was no, an indecent proposal. It really was. Was so, the money uh, indecent? And, and Sherry huh? was the, the money. money was indecent. And, the you know, Sherry had an amazing deal at the studio, which we shared in. And and she was great. We loved b making the movie with her. She added a ton. Wait, so. wait, wait, wait. So you skipped over a part that's important. She yeah. had an amazing deal at the studio, which you shared in. So you're talking about the back end yes. profit and you yes. guys got the benefit of the back Oh, no wonder you have a bigger house than I do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, uh, that's just the way it works, you know, it, 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 it worked in this situation. Well, that, that, it, that's how it's been working, right? I mean, it's about folks here who you put packages together and it's a must have. And when somebody really wants it, that's what they do. They pay a lot of money to for it on their platforms, uh, uh, in their theaters, you know, to get actors. Uh, when they put a bunch of big star actors together, the budgets explode, their salaries go yeah. up. So it's yeah. it's really yeah. about that bidding war kind of mentality 
that Hollywood, you know, that they have to have it. And it's the A types and it's the competitive nature of it. So and they had the studio had inadvertently tipped their hand as to how much they wanted it, because, as I said, the regime had changed between the time that Amy started the script and the time she finished it. So when we turned it in, they didn't know that they owned it. So they called me on Monday and said, oh, my God, we have to have this. We know you're producing. What what do we have to pay for this? So I just being kind of impish, I said, well, I'm going to have to think about that. Oh, please don't do this to us. Please have lunch with us. So I they we met in the executive dining room and the, all the studio. What do we have to pay? To and I just tormented them for about 20 minutes before I finally said, you know, you own it already. And they're like, what? <laughs> they didn't even know that the deal had it was pretty funny. So but so I knew they were re- they really wanted to make the movie. So we had some leverage in our, in our <laughs> negotiations. So um Oh my god, that's gotta be one of the rare producing uh situations, deals yeah, it, of all time. Fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, that's an yeah. amazing experience. So other than that, what would you say are the most enjoyable moments that you've had either working on a set or writing a script where you felt so in the zone or meeting, you know, having an actor take, take your, your script. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's been so many good ones, you know, I've had a lot, I mean, everything is good and bad, right? You have a great experience and then you say to yourself, this is probably as good as it's going to (laughs) get. The bad one's coming, you know, the other shoe is is going to fall. But, you know, obviously having Robin doing Dead Poets and that cast and, and Peter Weir, the Dead Poets Society experience, probably just amazing. And, you know, Peter was so collaborative in a certain sense. You know, he just said, I want you here. Feel free to say anything you want. You know, it was just uh, that was great. And Robin was just such a, a easy person to work with. He's such a good guy, was such a good guy. And, and, and uh you know, uh, so that 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 would be the standout. And then actually Double Down South was was a great experience. You know, I love the cast. They were just all so involved. And so everybody and, you know, it was it was a pretty small crew, only about 40 people. So it was just all everybody really working together in a great way to, to get this thing done. So supportive. Even the 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 background extras were amazing. And they, it, when we when we left Georgia to go to South Carolina, they they all came to us and said, we will go there on our own dime. You don't even have to pay us if you need us there. Mm. You know, we had budgeted for a few. Of course, we did pay them. But that was that's it, amazing. It just, that's a real yeah, it was really I mean, people just treated each other so well. And it was just, you know, I had such support as a director, as a person making the movie. It was it was unbelievable. So I did have one scene that I had to reshoot. Because I woke up in the middle of the night and went, oh, my God, I blew this scene. And, um, you know, they were just in the AD department just said, you know, well, we don't know how, but we will make this work. We'll get you in there and and did. You know, and, what was uh, the uh, what was the experience with uh, uh, what about Bob and Bill Murray, who's such a big movie star? And uh, yeah. but no, well, I hate to jump on Bill because he's got so much so much trouble already, but you know, Bill was difficult. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, difficult with you, with the director, with um, the cast. Uh, uh, he was, he was, you know, Bill was a little, unfortunately at that time, a little bit of a Jekyll and Hyde, you know, we, we could have really nice conversations and then he would take a nap and wake up just, just, you know, on the wrong side of the, of the hotel room or something. And just, you know, and, and so with me, it was just, you get a little nervous around someone like that because you never know whether they're kidding or whether they're truly angry about something. And then, you know, that started to, that, that, that leaked into all of his relationships <clears throat> on the move with my friend, Laura Ziskin, who was the producer and with Richard Dreyfus, who's already, you know, I think gone public with his, the, the situation that had happened with them. So there was kind of really a, you know, difficult feel. I, I was fired the day before, maybe first day into the shoot. Oh, wow. I not, didn't know that. Not, re- not replaced. Just now there's no, I'm just no longer welcome there. So, you know, except that I'm still behind the scenes, you know, working with Laura and looking at dailies and, you know, do, doing what you do as a writer. But it was, 
just an unpleasant way to be working on a movie. So, uh, and then Laurel was fired a few days after that and, you know, not replaced. So it just became a kind of, you know, I'm, they, I don't know how many people were left at the end. So. <laughs> well, and the mo- but the movie ended up doing pretty well. I mean, it came out, yeah, did, yeah it was funny yeah. as hell. And did, yeah, yeah. It, it, it didn't, you know, the, the, I think the enmity between Bill and, and Richard Dreyfuss worked, worked on screen, you know? So, um, uh, and I, you know, even as much as I was unhappy with with Bill personally, I thought, you know, I watched what he did in the movie and he was great. So yeah. I could still I could still sort of look past that and go, I think this is going to work. So it's interesting how there's movies that um, that have really difficult productions and they turn out great. There's movies with difficult productions and they're awful. Uh, you have a great production and it like we had on something about Mary and it went so smoothly. I thought, Oh, I, yeah. I don't know. We, we better have some trouble, some stories to tell. <laughs> know, Otherwise it's not going to be funny. Um, but it turned I, out. I can to- remember talking to you about that, that script before you all went and shit. You literally could not, you, you could not tell the, the story because you were laughing so hard <laughs> trying to, <laughs> trying to get past hilarious stuff, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. That, you know, so I, I the, because I'm what I'm relating to is your independent film, uh, Double Down yeah. South, and I had Wicked and I had Mary, and they we were traveling on film festivals at the same time, uh, and you know I have this little movie that's so much pain and so difficult, and depending on the audience, they liked it or they didn't like it, and every time I went into the theater within the first ten minutes, I knew if they didn't like it. Um, where something about Mary, no matter where I went, there was right. people rocking back and forth and. And uh, so, yeah, you know, yeah. I, you, but I put more work in the one that didn't work uh, right, as the right. other one. So to your point, yeah, you just you just keep putting it out there and you you yeah. don't know. It's good news, bad news. So, yeah, I, you know, there used to be a sort of old saw that if the movie was, you know, if there was trouble on production, there'd be trouble on the, you know, in the movie, just not true. Right. And, uh, you know, some very troubled movies become you know, great movies. And then the opposite can, you can just feel like it's working and, and then you want to see it all together and you just go, Oh, <laughs> you know, this is, this is, this is, didn't work. So. Were there stories that you read when you were a kid that have found their way or influenced any of your films along the way? Is there. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I I know you want me to say Alice in Wonderland. Oh no, no. I, I I'm going to ask you about Alice in a in, yeah. in a minute, but, but uh, well, I'm just curious I, I, if you I were. I read a lot as a kid, and I you know I read so much. I tend to forget about what I read, you know. But I you know, I don't. Think so it so. filtered in there some way, or maybe it didn't. Maybe you just you know you're you're an originalist, so. I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think I'm any more original than anybody else, but I do, since I forget where all my sources come from, <laughs> it feels like it sprang you know, straight out of my head. But I'm sure that's not the case. Well, since this is a All Things Alice podcast, and I normally ask guests what their first introduction or if they have Alice pop culture influences, um, why don't you share a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I read Alice in Wonderland probably freshman year in oh, high school. Okay. And, uh, you know, and had a teacher who essentially told us, you know, th- this is almost like a puzzle within a story within a puzzle that there is multi layers in this thing, you know. And so in college, I took a class where Alice was on the, on the uh, curriculum and we read a book called The Annotated Alice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which is just this, it's like, you know, oh my God, you you can tell every word, every phrase, every sentence, every paragraph, every character, you know, the the level, the depth of the thing is staggering, you know, to the point where you just, you, you can't really even absorb it all. It's so amazing. And, you know, and so there, so I knew this had been written by a genius and therefore I was too intimidated to really even <laughs> penetrate it beyond that. And I, you know, I can, I can remember, you know, spending a, a portion of the semester working on that, you know, and just not under, you know, it's like, it's like a book that is in itself almost a key to a, a whole universe that is not there on the page, yeah. you know, so 
how do you how do you absorb that? So you know, and to that, you know, hats off to you for for taking it into this other direction. You know, the Looking Glass Wars and all that. So it's you know, it's it was it was it's it's you know, one can only hope to be able to write something with that much depth. You know, it's it's uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think um, you know one thing about Dead Poet Society, it really stands the test of time. Uh, and that was over 20 years ago. So uh, obviously, you know, Alice has been around a long time. But um, I know you're into politics, and I don't know if you've you've seen how many headlines during the Trump administration there was of we're through, we're down the rabbit hole, we're through yes. the looking glass, we're all mad here for whatever yeah. reason. Uh, and Kirshner just came out with saying the best way to to contextualize the Trump presidency was through Alice in Wonderland, you know, you know, off with your head and then we'll have the trial. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, <laughs> I, 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 I know you've noticed that because. Uh, Absolutely. Well, look, it, metaphorically, it's probably been used in, in that way as much as any modern thing out there, any modern text, you know, uh, as you say, it stands the test of time that way. And for for a story that's so, you know, just from a young person's perspective, so whimsical and, you know, uh, you, you don't, nothing like it has really survived, has it? I no, mean, well, well, if you think about um, w- w- Winter Wonderland um, and how often we're using it to describe magical places, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I suppose Middle Earth or Oz, there's an equivalent. They use it a lot. But Wonderland is really, you know, is part of our language. It's the vocabulary which which we're describing things these days. Yeah. Um, so, and, uh, and, but it, it makes, it's not nonsense, but it has, you know, uh, once you get to Middle Earth and you understand the rules, then it's consistent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Alice in Wonderland is always changing. It's always morphing. It's it's always so you can't really get feel grounded there. And yet, so many, there's it's hard to find something like that is so ungrounded where people could stick with it. You know? Which is it's, why there's been very few Alice in Wonderland adaptations that have been you know successful, with the exception right. of. Tim Burton's, but the second movie didn't really work because there's not a grounded logic and world to it, which is what I've attempted to do with the Looking Glass Wars, is yeah. bring a kind of Middle Earth style where there's rules and governance and uh, a logic to it. So, um, but, you know, haven't had the success of of Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings, but I, right. I, I, well, I stick keep, with it. I st- still, yeah, yeah. St- I, I still have you. By the time I get to be your age, I'll, I'll, I'm sure it'll be <laughs> super successful. And one last thing, um, if you were to describe your golf game using Alice in Wonderland as a metaphor, uh, what uh, would that be? Yeah, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> um, I would have to say, um, yeah, I'm like the Mad Hatter. You know, I'm just <laughs> you're not you're not Humpty Dumpty putting back no, all the pieces. No, with... I'm, not the, I'm not Alice. I, it, the Mad Hatter with you know, just with, even with the the notion of a little bit of anger all the time. You know, is kind of the the uh, yeah. It's, well, it's, well, the thing about the the thing about your profession and carrying all these stories in your head and all these ideas and finding ways to. Um, to uh, pull them together to create something. When it comes to golf, uh, my experience golfing with you, which you had a lot of swing thoughts going on. And uh, so it was, and I remember, you know, it's like, okay, when you played great, it was like one thing. You took it off the range, we went and played, and that was right, one thing. Right. And then when you weren't playing well, we'd go to dinner and you'd say, yeah, well, I was thinking about this. I had my elbow too high and I got to straighten up my arm and I wasn't, and I was like, Come on, man. This yeah. is not in your head. This has to be fully body and body only. Yeah, yeah. it's funny because I just, as as you would probably guess, found somebody who's helping me with that. For the first teacher who just immediately said, oh, you are really, your arms, you, you're trying to swing with your arms. You know, no wonder you can't play golf, you know. <laughs> it's like, well, how else? I, it's a, that club is attached to my arms, what, you know. But uh, and he's just been great at like saying, oh, I see, you know, 
here's what try this, you know, so we'll see it's it's working on the range. And, you know, it's the same thing Brady was teaching me, but just for a slightly different angle. And we'll see. We'll see what happens. But, well, that's when we first met. I, I, I bring up yeah. golf because well, you, you, you know, were. I think the first time we met was early in the time you started playing golf. Right. We went out with with our our or my agent and we were and you, you know, within about a year, you were, you know, kicking my ass out there, which is really. Yeah, really that's cool. when we met it was but right before it was in 88 or 89 or something. And, uh, you yeah, know, Jeremy had me out to play golf and we met and I had played one summer when I was 12 or 13. So I had, you know, swung the club and, and I said, Oh, this is, this is kind of fun, but it wasn't until I had played with you guys a few times and I thought, Oh, I should go to the driving range. And at the driving range, there was something sort of meditative about being on your own and trying to find the synchronicity of your body in this, this stationary you know, ball that, you know, you're trying to, right. and, right. and then the sensation of hitting it purely going through your hands. And I, I thought, oh, I could hang out here. And, and, and that's when I, and that's when I got into golf. And yeah. Then, yeah. And then so. you were killing it. And I guess you intuitively understood that it's not, uh, you're not hitting it with your hands, even though you're holding the club, right? You're well, it was from oriented. It yeah. was from skiing that I knew that. I mean, I didn't know anything about golf, but I knew that in skiing I was using all the big muscles, and right. so. And the other thing I knew about skiing was that if I was thinking about it too much, I was doing it wrong. I had right. to think about it when I was practicing, and then I had to let go of it when I was competing or just you know having fun going down the mountain. So. Yeah. For a yeah. while that for a while that really worked, but the problem is the more you work on it, the more you get in your head and the more you get in yeah. your head, the worse you get and then you make choice and then you're trying to you know, you, it it's it's Alice in Wonderland. It's 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 yeah. illogical. Yeah. You, go, you go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. And you're <laughs> you can't figure out how to get back. <laughs> you know? so. Where can where can folks um see your movie? It's going to be at the Three Rivers Film Festival in mid November and then it's coming out uh, in about 60 cities in January, mid-January. I think the 19th is what they're projecting right now. So assuming that the actors strike ends and our actors can promote the movie, which I, I think is going to happen. And you would you would be waiting for that, right? You want the actors... Yeah, we were, we were supposed to come out in September, but without the actors' ability to promote, we couldn't. We couldn't. So uh, because, you know, they'll be relying on that for for some of the marketing stuff. So, um, yeah, so January, mid January 19th, I think it should be in uh, again, 60 cities. One Terrific. Or two Terrific. Yeah. So for That's... about a month and then it'll be on platforms. And do you have a platform? Uh, it, they, they go for all the platforms okay. right the first. And then after, a, I think a 90 or 120 day platform run, which is basically pay-per-view, then, then, it, then they'll find a you know a home on a streamer, you know, Hulu, Netflix, one of those. Well, so. it's a terrific movie, uh, and I'm sure audiences will find it. And I want to thank you, friend. Oh, this was so much fun! I'm so glad you you had me on the podcast. So. Yeah, and thanks for sharing all those great stories and oh, the my pleasure ups and downs of uh, of the creative process and the business. And again, congrats on the new movie. Thanks, Frank. Bye, Tommy. 